You... The th <sighs> this God, you, you, just look at that. Um, huh? <sighs> this movie is such shit. I'm sorry, am I watching a wrestling movie or a commercial for a two-week night school course in computer animation? Honestly, I can't tell if they spent all the film's budget on this intro or none of it. Come and get me, big boy. Uh, what is she going to do with that bell? We begin by seeing some interesting foreplay from Rocco and Diamond Piedra, played by Don Fry and April Hunter. The movie tells you this couple is a pair of wrestling legends, but you certainly wouldn't know it because outside of this motel room tussle, there is no wrestling from either of these people in the movie. Never mind the fact that Fry and Hunter both have experience in the business, but no, let's downplay the whole wrestling thing about them. Fast forward nine months and the Piedras go to the delivery room, or rather, a regular exam room gussied up as a delivery room, and in walks the doctor. We didn't order Chinese food. I came here to deliver your baby, not food. Oh, is... is that a thing? Chain-smoking Chinese OBs? Ha <laughs> ha! After that super realistic sound effect, the Piedras meet their new plastic child, but Rocco is disappointed to learn that it isn't a boy like he had hoped. Bring me my Chinese soup. For him? I'm not worried about him. My soup is getting cold, and I'm gonna finish off lunch. Oh, is that also a thing? Chinese OBs who just lose their accent whenever? Ha! Ah! We jump another 12 years into the future and meet Sandy, Rocco and Diamond's daughter, as she gets ready for the first day of school, which appears to be some bizarre hybrid of K through 8 and high school all rolled into one? Is this town that small? You see, gentlemen, money makes the world turn around. <laughs> wow, indeed. The first of many ham-fisted Jews love money jokes you'll see in this film. Why are you so quiet? Are you trying to bully in secret? Stop! Stop! Okay, a dollar each if you leave them alone all year round. That is a crappy trade for a bully. You're missing out on a ton of lunch money there. Ooh, hello. I went to be here. That's your keeper. Hey, can I carry that for you? No. This school is like a school you would find on a show like Recess or Doug, but instead of the kids' quirks being charming, they're horrifying. Sandy officially introduces herself to the boy who was being bullied earlier. His name is Robert John, but insists that he be called... The little Jewish boy from earlier, who is supposed to be a sympathetic figure, suddenly gets all homophobic for no reason. What's your problem? You are a queerdo. I want to be a pro wrestler when I grow up. Yeah, probably a good idea just to change the subject. And I'll marry the son of my wrestling hero, Mr. Pop Hub the Ring. The what? And I'll marry the son of my wrestling hero, Mr. Pop Hub the Ring. It just don't add up! Watch out, monster! The gang's here! Yes, that gang of him, an 18 year old, and an 8 year old. And wow, what shitty kids in the background. After that madness, the bully, whose name is Monster, goes after Sandy because... I know you like me. Yes, because this upset glance from earlier clearly shows that. Here comes my dad. Ink, my wrestling heaven. That's not a saying. The film spends the next eight agonizingly bad minutes showing the fallout from this first day of school. This includes talking on corded phones with no doc, and prepubescent boys battling for the love of this girl who isn't into any of them. But hey, at least we get to see more great acting chops from young Sandy. You're going down. You're taking a fall, Dad! Well, stronger promo than Sasha Banks when she's a face. But Jesus, nothing compares to the insanity on display by young Jewish person Marty Shalom Weinstein. Oh my god, that name. Uh, just, just go to the clips. You are the woman of my dreams. I am going to marry you. I'm too young to be thinking about girls. I 
think I love her. Now I have to work on you from another school. But at least I have you. <laughs> Horrifying. Also, did you notice this goal board? Yeah, lock this kid up right now. Well, that was some of the most ridiculous exposition I've ever seen. How far into this movie are we now anyway? What? We jump ahead in the timeline yet again, 10 years into the future. We find that Robert John has grown up to become the gayest gay man who ever gayed. I mean, Titus Andromedon's a classier stereotype than this guy. You want it? Then come and take it. <laughs> My name is Shabba-ba-ba-bam! You know, if you spend 10 years trying to push a self-appointed nickname onto your friends and it doesn't stick, might be time to move on. John, don't be yelling at my mother, you queer shithead. You know how you call your best friend horrible things? We meet a grown-up monster who by this point has been Sandy's on-again, off-again boyfriend with a disloyal past. Monster's played by Japanese bodybuilder Kenya Suda, but according to the credits, he was originally supposed to be played by Gene Snitsky. I'm guessing he had to back out once he got signed to a developmental deal by WWE in 2003. And he should thank his lucky stars for that too. I'll take the abortionist slash foot fetishist gimmick any day over being involved in this pile of crap. Anyway, Monster's supposed to be one of the best wrestlers around, so it's surprising to see him apply a headlock on the wrong side. <gasps> oh, so what? I knew you wanted to beat me like a baby. That's not a saying. Sandy and Robert John go to a party, which doubles as a planning meeting for their high school reunion, which seems like an unnecessary plot device. It's there that they reunite with a grown-up Marty, who is definitely not played by me. For the young lady, your favorite. A pina colada in the coconut with a twist of liquor, a spurt of lemon, your favorite mango mix. Whipped cream with a cherry on top. Of all the issues I have with this, my biggest one is, where did he get a coconut at that party? We found them! Marty, who's very wealthy because he tells us enough times, has no chill when it comes to his childhood crush. So, Sandy, yeah, I heard you broke up with Monster. Now I'm an established wealthy businessman that could provide all a woman could ever dream of. Yeah, keep in mind, we're supposed to be rooting for that guy. Robert John tries to leave the party by himself, but is confronted by another pair of area wrestlers, including China, and she goes and does whatever the hell this is. Hey, hey, Robert John, I just want to say, tell me that you're not my type, tell me that you're good. Then, for some reason, China sexually assaults Robert John. <laughs> <Mommy>. <laughs> Robert John is deeply shaken by this turn of events for all of one minute of screen time, then he's back to his jolly old self and the China rape is practically never mentioned again. It's almost as if that scene was totally unnecessary. Oh my god, this comedy is about to turn into a tragedy. At a party hosted by Rocco and Diamond, we see more of China, whose character is named Roxanne, and her boyfriend, Rock and Bull. Apparently, China's character has special powers that allows her drink to magically refill mid-scene. And I'm willing to bet the contents of that glass weren't water. Okay, movie, is he or is he not the hero of this picture? If he is, don't add the creepy music! Sandy goes to confront Monster because she thinks that he might have been the one who attacked Robert John after the reunion party, even though we saw his actual assailant at the barbecue moments earlier and Robert John didn't even flinch. If I didn't know he was a sissy, I would thank you to a couple. He is more of a man and a woman than you'll ever be. Yeah, sick burn? The jilted former boyfriend has his friends kidnap Sandy, holy shit, but she fends for herself while Marty has his own problems. I came from a girl. Oh. It's at this point that Marty finally confesses his feelings for Sandy. Monster's not a good man. I don't understand why you've been with him for so long. On Sundays, I visited your home and left a pink rose, hoping that one day you catch me in the act. I've loved you since the first day I laid eyes on you. Now there's no one standing between us. Wow, what a nice guy he's being. I wonder if that yarmulke turns into a fedora. Sandy, my love. Wow. So, 
Let me get this straight. The message here is, if you love somebody and if you're persistent enough, if you stalk them enough, if you tell them you love them enough, even if they tell you no, even if they punch you in the face, if you just keep pressing, just keep pressuring them and you go and force yourself on them, she's eventually gonna turn around and just love you right back. Cause hey, as long as you mean well, she'll totally understand. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. This right here is that stupid Shawn Mendes song come to life or every other nice guy song or TV show or movie played out in one of the laziest and most awful ways I've ever seen. Just patronize the woman, tell her what's what, and she'll come around. She'll wake up from her trance and realize you're the one she should have been with all along. Yep, sounds like a realistic plan to me. True love conquers all. No means yes. So anyway, Sandy's spell is broken and the two engage in a lovey-dovey montage for a solid three minutes. Yep, nothing says love quite like romping around on a kid's play structure. Back at wrestling school, Robert John antagonizes Rock and Bull just a little too much. And is it really a sport when you don't get to play with balls? I love to play with your balls. <laughs> Bull takes down this pastel Daffy Duck when Marty comes to his aid after spending an eternity hung up on the ropes. Bull challenges Marty to put up or shut up in the ring, so Marty does the noble thing and tries to hire someone to kill Bull? I'll pay big money to have a subject taken care of for me. What? No. With assassination off the table, Marty has to train for his big match, which means, you guessed it, Another montage! <laughs> Say, do you think it would help at all if, you know, he trained to wrestle? <laughs> sure, why not? It's the night of the big match, and Rock and Bull gets one last bit of intimidation in before he and Marty square off. Let's see. Let's see. It. <laughs> You know, I get the feeling that China never got a script for this movie and has just been doing everything off the top of her head. Because this is ostensibly a wrestling movie, it only makes sense to shove some actual wrestling into the thing about an hour in. We see Monster take on Roxanne in a match before the main event. Established wrestler Rock and Bull versus a scrawny Jewish kid that nobody knows. <laughs> Forget the porn thing, that's why China hasn't gone in the Hall of Fame yet. As predicted, Bull beats the insert Jewish pun here out of Marty for a while, with the fans cheering for all of it. <laughs> Marty's in a bad way until Monster makes the face turn and is promptly destroyed for his efforts, but suddenly Wrestler X comes to save the day. <laughs> So Marty defends the honor of his friend, he gets the girl, everyone lives happily ever after, roll the credits. How? The beast will never let his beauty go. You will eventually get tired and leave me alone. Please, he's nothing but a screwball. I don't ever want anything serious with him. Okay, so this took me a few rewinds to figure out what the hell was happening here, so let's take things one step at a time. Sandy and Robert John are talking about Monster. Sandy says she never wants to see him again. This random lady overhears only part of that conversation. It turns out she's Marty's sister. Though the character had never been established before this, she has no idea who Sandy's actually talking about, nor do we know if she's ever even met Sandy. But she takes that one little piece of overheard information and rushes to call Marty, who's away on business in Paris, which you know because of his fabulous view of the Eiffel Tower, and tells him that Sandy doesn't like him anymore, which completely goes against the previous scene. Call me a screwball. If you watch this scene only once and don't pay 100% attention to it, you will have no idea what's going on for the rest of this movie. And even if you are paying attention, it's still a tremendous leap in logic for the viewer to take. But hey, this isn't a movie that's meant to be logical or even good, it's just another romantic wrestling comedy. Ugh. Uh, what's going on? D did I miss something else? Wait, why are we screaming? Can... Can this be a dream? I'd, I'd like to wake up now, please. Marty returns home and is too brokenhearted to even see Sandy again. Up close, that is. But Robert John knows just what to do to lift his spirits and get them back together. It's, it's a montage. It's a makeover montage. Now you must remember to follow all of my instructions. 
Otherwise, your eyes will not accept the lenses. Oh, good. I was worried we weren't going to see another lazy ethnic stereotype before the movie was over. How? How? How many times must I tell you not to do that? Well, that went from being lazy to just being dumb. As Robert John works to make Marty look marginally different than before, Sandy has a heart-to-heart -heart with her parents, who haven't aged a day since the beginning of this movie. Though my soul has aged tremendously. She explains that even though her father wants her to marry a wrestler, her heart belongs only to Marty. I'm so sorry to disappoint you, Daddy. Baby girl. That'll never happen. Hold it! Okay, is this or is this not supposed to be a Romeo and Juliet type love story? Two people from different backgrounds, they fall in love, the parents don't approve. It's been established pretty early on, right? Monster's a good wrestler. I mean, a good man. Well, you know my daddy. He won't approve of me marrying anyone but the biggest wrestler. Monster's the one for our princess. Just, you know, they'll get back together. Give it some time, you know? Even the back of the DVD cover makes it clear that Sandy is breaking tradition by doing this. But when Sandy says she loves Marty, do the parents raise a fuss? No, they just say, that's okay, dear. You're your own woman. Go and be with the man you love. Which, yes, they absolutely should be doing as supportive, loving parents, but we as an audience have been told from the beginning this would not be the case. And now all of a sudden everything's hunky-dory? Where's the conflict? What was the turning point? Where's the clash of tradition we were promised? But you know what? Hey, it's okay, because it's not a movie that's supposed to make a lick of goddamn sense. It's just another romantic wrestling comedy. Ugh. So the sister from before clears up the mix-up she herself caused and tells Sandy to meet up with Marty at the next reunion party. When she gets there, Marty and Monster propose to her simultaneously. What is a girl to do? Marry the possessive, psychotic musclehead who cheated on her countless times? Or marry the iron Wolf stalker who literally forced himself on her to get his way? It's the day of the wedding. Sandy's getting ready to marry the man of her dreams when old gay Robert John makes his entrance. Came to check something before the wedding. Zuh? Oh, uh, Sandy, I, I don't know. I... Boy, that brief moment where Robert John might have turned straight after kissing his best friend on her wedding day sure was there. It's time for the ceremony and wait a minute, she's marrying Monster? Marty doesn't get to the church? The priest seems way too excited? Monster, you may kiss the bride. What is going on in this movie? I'm so confused. I'm so lost. I just don't know what's what in Wait. That's not what happened. Oh. They Wayne's world at us. Why would they do that? So in the 100% completion ending, Sandy marries Marty after all, they live happily ever after, roll the credits. What the fuck? It's not over yet. You know what they say. It's not over until the fat lady sings. <laughs> <laughs> unnecessary sign is unnecessary. So we jump ahead another five years to find out that Sandy and Marty are expecting their second child. Those are my parents. No, they're not weird. This movie sure as hell is though. Like my mommy and grandmommy always said, the good stories end with and they lived happily ever after. Sorry, that ain't saving this pile of shit. And that was just another romantic wrestling comedy. The thing is, wait a minute, a bonus ending? <laughs> you take that question mark away, Kim Sky. You take that shit away right now. Folks, I talk about a lot of bad stuff on this show. I often say things like, this is the worst such and such I've ever seen. But in the grand scheme of things, rarely have I ever truly meant it. But, <laughs> oh man folks, this is a shoot. This is, without a doubt, the absolute worst movie I have ever seen, ever. There is not one redeeming thing to be said about this movie. Zilch. Nada. In most reviews, I try to find one good thing to say. Maybe the way something's depicted or a casting choice. But nope, no silver lining to be had here, folks. Every frame, every scene, every line of piss-poor dialogue felt like a china forearm to the nuts. By the end of this movie, I was begging for death.
One thing that could have saved this from being the biggest waste of celluloid in history was a major rewrite. A big reason this movie was so bad is that everything was backward. Here's what you do. First off, don't make the hero of the movie a creepy stalker. Second, don't make the hero of the movie a creepy stalker. Next, lose the no means yes scene and ditch the sister's misunderstanding subplot. And why not just kill off the first 17 minutes of this movie entirely? From there, maybe start off with Marty, a nerdy wrestling fan pining for Sandy. She comes around him after he saves her from Monster and defends Robert John. The parents show their disapproval because he isn't a wrestler. Marty stumbles his way into a match with Monster, wins on his own by sheer luck and cunning, earns the respect of Sandy's parents, and he and Sandy live happily ever after. No Wayne's worlding. Boom! I just turned this film from super shitty to regular shitty, that still doesn't save it from a deluge of bad dialogue, even worse acting, and an onslaught of ethnic and homophobic jokes that aren't even clever enough to be offensive. By its pure rating alone, this movie should be one of the worst of all time on IMDb's list, even worse than Santa with Muscles, but it doesn't officially register because there are too few votes. That's right, this movie is so bad, people can't even bring themselves to vote on how bad it is. Oh, but don't worry folks, because this movie is award-winning. Apparently it won honorable mention for the Audience Award in the 2006 New Jersey International Film Festival. What, did a movie with puppies getting beat with a bat for two hours just miss the entry deadline? I wonder if it won the award because it was shot in the state, or if it's because New Jerseyans are really that easily amused. So folks, please do yourselves a favor and do not go and seek out this movie under any circumstances. Please learn from my mistakes. Don't see it, folks. This movie is not so bad it's good. This movie is so bad, so bad, so bad. And if your significant other wants to watch this movie with you, think you'll be watching some average rom-com, run, because it's even worse than that. Run and trade up for someone with a venereal disease or something, because that's even less horrible than watching this movie. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.